still not working for some reason. Okay. So, also, what school is the first one of the old South to desegregate? And what court case? And what court case did that say at least for education? What's the court case? It goes back to 1896. It's separate but equal. Plessy versus Ferguson. All the things sound familiar. And why is it a rock so high? Yeah, poor working class. Kind of goes back to thinking of Bacon's Rebellion. Okay, so this is why it's such an amazing time. You have all these things coming together in the 1960s. You have the Cold War, this new affluent society, new middle class society, civil rights, and student feminism, a changing world. What an amazing time. And the Beatles. And so with that, Sputnik, we talked about this, right? The first satellite? Yeah. Yes. Who's the new leader of the Soviet Union? Khrushchev. What letter are they nearly out of now? H. <laughs> all right, so Nikita. All right, so the big thing was this, you can imagine how this just terrified people. All of a sudden, the Soviets now this missile, you can see the satellite because it's such a low orbit, you can see it almost every night. I know a lot of you have seen satellites in orbit now, every once in a while you might see one. But this was such a low orbit, you can see it very easily. Yes, it degrades. It's still up there. No. Yeah, it burns up actually relatively fast. Had a little battery with, with a short wave. Uh, broadcast and it just little beat. You hear a little beat. I didn't to get night, but now the Soviets are upon us. And they can have a missile that could hit the United States. Eisenhower at first tried to downplay it, but politically that was a mistake. People were panicking. Remember that feeling that's been growing that the Soviets were winning the Cold War. And even though the United States was actually ahead, in a lot of ways, and just says narrow moment the Soviets had an advantage, they took bigger risks. And so Eisenhower finally realized after our headlines like Russian victory, he announced that there are actually two groups working on rockets, the Navy and the Army. And he announced the Navy team is ready to launch a satellite. Who was, after hearing that, who do you suppose was the most surprised about that announcement? The Navy were not ready at all. And so, just to show you real quick, there's the Navy launch. It made it about a foot, then blew up. You know, see the, the little mini. It actually wasn't even going to be a salad. They just want to get out of the atmosphere and then come back in, just to do something like that. And this blew up. There are a lot of newspaper headlines now to make fun of this. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> I like Kaputnik too, but Plotnik's good. But this led to a couple of things. The Army and Navy team had to unify into NASA. One organization for, at first, just simply missiles, but then also space exploration. NASA, what does that stand for? National Aeronautics. National Aeronautics and? Space. Administration, yeah. I know we got Association Administration. National Aeronautics. Air, air, <laughs> National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And by the way, where's it headquartered? Yeah, Texas. Why? Lyndon Johnson, the Senate Majority Leader. He had power. So even though they launched from from, from Florida, yeah. What's the SMS? Space Administration. And. Thus, the beginnings of the space race with the Soviet Union, and the real big thing was, you know, the Cold War. Who will be the first one up there? But the big thing is, this is Defense Department. Missiles for ICBMs, satellites for spying. To this day, much of NASA's funding is, is indirectly, it's indirectly from the Defense Department or the National Security Agency for spying. And also science education. The federal government's going to pump a little bit of money for the first time in American history directly to K through 12 schools. Now, the federal government doesn't give all that much money, but since <coughs> schools never have enough money, it does matter. But that all starts right here, and it's meant as a Cold War issue. After science and math, the feeling was the Soviets must be way ahead. Now, that actually is not true. The United States has. It's, you know, because we have such local control. Some areas we have very good schools, some not, and it's almost always directly related to, you don't see this much in Montana because we're such a small state, but how wealthy the neighborhoods are, where the schools are, directly proportional how well the school is. 
fact, you can always tell how students do in the school by just knowing their zip code. It's directly proportional since we said have such a high poverty rate to this day. It does directly affect schools much more than other countries that do not have high as poverty rates. And after the uh, Scopes Monkey trial back in the 1920s and 25, school districts were scared to do to do uh, science because of the fundamentalist backlash. But here now it's cold war. Now it's cold war. Federal help, it's been yet good and bad. You hit and miss. And so that's Sputnik. But the thing about it was, is Eisenhower, part of the reason for his whole new book was he wanted to end the decade as a peace state. Now he is playing a pretty dangerous game. But the interesting thing was, Khrushchev actually came to the United States in 59. It was supposed to be a short visit just to the UN, but he actually traveled across the US for two weeks. Saw a cow in Wisconsin. Everyone sees this very cow in Wisconsin in this day. And at the brand new Disneyland in Anaheim. And Khrushchev went across, and the plan was for a Paris peace summit, that they would actually talk real arms control. In fact, both sides, at least in the short run, quit testing nuclear weapons in the open atmosphere. I mean, there was a growing feeling, despite of everything, that perhaps some kind of peace agreement. And the big reason why was that Khrushchev wanted to end the arms race. The Soviet Union could not afford to spend all that money on weapons. They were short of everything, especially after the war, which they never really effectively rebuilt to this day. And he wants it. In fact, Khrushchev would formally denounce Stalin in 59. There were tens of thousands of statues of Stalin all over it behind the Iron Curtain. They all came down. It's almost impossible to find the statue of Stalin. I know. I can see you're upset. Now, there's plenty of other Soviet statues. If you go to any place in the former Soviet Union, and junkyards and various places are filled to the brim with them. In Budapest, there is a statue park, and it's acres of old Stalinist era statues. And it's one of the coolest things I've ever been to. Okay, Budapest is not cool. Budapest is incredibly hot. <laughs> Average temperature. <laughs> Actually, there's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. So it's small in the corner of the day, the arms race? Probably not. He was too paranoid. Khrushchev thought that was the only way to save it, because the Stalin was dead. And I'll tell you what happened to Stalin's body after he denounced him. I'll tell you that later. But here's the deal. Part of the reason Eisenhower felt so confident with peace talks is because he knew that the Americans were actually way ahead in nuclear weapons in planes and missile te technology. How did he know? This plane. The U-2 spy plane. Invented in the early 1950s. U is just the meaningless means utility. But it could fly at 65,000 feet. Had a range of 8,000 miles. Just imagine this big glider. Couldn't maneuver. Its defense was getting above Soviet air defenses. And the Soviets could see it fly over. Or could pick it up on radar but they couldn't get up to shoot it down. And so the United States is going to do hundreds of flights over the Soviet Union with this. And actually, with other planes, they'll do over 3,000 over flights of the Soviet Union, all flagrantly violating international law. Just blatantly, just violating the law. If that would happen to the US, we would lose our mind in anger. And yet we were doing it to the Soviet Union. Which, by the way, made them very insecure. Once again, this is going to lead to a big event when they're very insecure and convinced that the United States is only doing this for one reason. We're going to attack. We're leading to something called the Cuban Missile Crisis. But this camera at 65,000 feet, the pictures taken from that camera, could read, you could read the license plates on cars. And that's how detailed they were. So Eisenhower knew, now this is all top secret because of national security, but let's have our peace talk. The problem is Khrushchev is furious, and Khrushchev made it clear, there's no Paris peace summit if these plans continue to do this, because the U.S. always officially denied it. So Eisenhower agreed, no more flights. All this is all secret. And Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA, said, 
one more flight. There's a missile, there's some missiles in Kazakhstan we want to check. One more flight. You, you know what's going to happen, right? So flying out of Iran, remember Iran? They put the Shah in there, so they gave us bases. Now these are done by the CIA, even though they take average Air Force pilots who have a great amount of stamina, because they've been flying forever. They're not very fast planes. And Francis Gary Powers, that May of 1960. And the CIA pilots were getting really weird. These planes, they kept putting on more stuff, special paint, which was very heavy, but it would deflect radar. They put new electronics, better cameras. They're weighing them down, and now they're they're not able, they're having trouble getting up to high altitude, and the Soviets are getting closer every time they fly. And so all these pilots are like warned, we're in trouble. They might be able to get us. Because they know they can see them on radar. Well, in fact, that last mission, by the way, you look at that, that's a G suit, and they actually look almost like astronauts. That last mission he got up, or he couldn't get up over 50,000 feet. Really struggling with the plane. 1,500 miles over the Soviet Union, the engine went out. And he started to glide down. Now he's frantically trying to get the engine restarted. They're trying everything. Finally gets the engine restarted, and that's when basically they have a warning, a sensor where they can pick up a radar that's locked onto it. A Soviet surface air missile is on its way. Now these are big, massive things that would explode, that hope the shrapnel would knock the plane down. The problem is these things can't maneuver. They, they can't climb very fast. They're designed just to fly a long time. It was sunk. The plane was hit. The idea was, hey, these are spies. They can't get captured. They can be espionage. They can be executed. Remember the United States executed Ethel and Julius Rosenberg for espionage just a few years earlier. And so they didn't have an ejector seat. If you lift the can canopy off, which the way they would do for propeller planes, and try to bail out that way that's hit, first of all, it's spinning like mad. But secondly, they bail out, they get caught in the exhaust. You gotta have an injector seat, you just really can't use a jet. Why they do that? Save weight, because if you're gonna pilot will die anyways. And then they gave the pilots a pistol just in case they were able to bail out. What's that pistol for? Yeah, no prisoner. They're not supposed to be captured. Power somehow got out of the spinning plane. Would dislocate his shoulder and break his collarbone doing it, but got out, bailed out, landed, he lived, and decided he didn't want to kill himself. And so he 1,500 miles within the Soviet Union. He was captured by a farmer with a pitchfork. What's he going to do? Run away? He's caught. He knows. It. And Khrushchev is furious. They brought him. Well, first off, they said the U.S. had a cover story. Cover story. Weather plane got lost. We're sorry for the loss of the brave crew. Cover story. And then Khrushchev announced, furious, heat, furious. We got your spy plane. And the United States responded with the Eisenhower administration. Typical Soviet treachery. We would never do that. And then they brought the pilot out, and there he is. That's what he looked like. And you notice, because he's got his insulin. And then there's the wreckage. If you go to the Russian War Museum in Moscow today, the wreckage of the YouTube is still there. And some of the films survived. So they have the pictures. This scuttled the Paris Peace Talk. Done. And the Cold War is going to get significantly hotter. Get it? Uh -huh. But it's going to get worse. <coughs> this is a big deal. We still use the U2 today. So use it one. Yeah. What ended up happening? Huh? What ended up happening? Well, actually, he, they put on for espionage, and they could afford to be getting down on this. They did not execute him. They held him in prison, and then three years later, to be exchanged for a bunch of uh, Soviet spies captured in Western Europe. We were desperate to get him back, so we traded him for 30. So, yeah. They had the bargain because he was such, that was such a big deal. But he, he was. How would the U.S. help him have told him that he was not? Oh, we figured he told them. So why would they want to die? It's in America. Who would ever spy if they knew you would ever we would do anything to get back? And also it was very humiliating we wanted back in the country. So you know. And so I, I've never been to Moscow. I want to go to that museum. I guess it's just amazing. 
I like those kind of museums. But I do want to see the U2. I think that'd be cool. But everybody started testing bombs like mad after this. Like mad. In fact, it was after the U2 when the Soviets would explode the biggest atomic bomb ever. What is it, you know? Uh, is that a bomb? Yeah, this, uh, the Tsar's bomb, 50 megatons. You can see the flash from 600 miles away. But why they do it? There's only one reason to do it. That is now intimidation. That's like, okay, you might have this, but look at this. In fact, the election of 1960 then is very much going to be this Cold War election, especially what happened early in the year at the same time, Cuba. The corrupt Batista regime was overthrown. I don't know why I put Batista versus Castro, but socialist guerrillas under Fidel Castro overthrew a very corrupt dictator. And remember, the United States had been supporting dictators going back to the Spanish-American War. Do you remember the Platt Amendment that said the U.S. could intervene any time that the U.S. has? And so the U.S. helped Batista right there on Time Magazine. And his leadership, he was a kleptocracy. They just stole from the people of Cuba. In fact, he might be best known for allowing the U.S. Mafia into Havana. And they built a bunch of casinos, and that became the place to go. You from the East Coast, you fly down to Havana. Like, there was a big playground for the very wealthy casinos and all that kind of stuff. In fact, he was so corrupt that the United States finally dropped its support in 58. And so when this army literally collapsed on New Year's Eve in 1959, they left. Castro marched in, and the U.S. was relatively ambivalent. The amazing thing is Castro's guerrilla force lost every battle, never won a battle. For most of them, they had to hide in the jungles and in the mountains. And they won the war. Remember the United States did that in the Revolutionary War. Lost the battles, won the war. And that's the key thing for these guerrilla armies like this. As long as you can stay intact, stay in the fight, eventually the other side will quit, will leave. Batista literally, they just took everything and ran to the United States. A bunch of these Cuban exiles would take root in Florida, which is still a very big Cuban, uh, Cuban exile uh, community. And it's a little bit weird. You got some are literally kind of thugs and hooligans from the Batista regime, and some are legitimately fleeing what's going to become in, in Cuba. We don't know what Castro would have been. He was a socialist. But in 1960, when he went to the United States, there he is. He met with Richard Nixon. And do you remember land reform when I talked about Guatemala? Do you remember that term, land reform? Give the land to the peasants? Once he said land reform, Nixon told Eisenhower that Castro is a communist. Was he? Maybe. I don't know. But that pushed him closer to the Soviet Union. I love this picture. He also appeared on the Ed Sullivan show. And maybe my, so he's going to be closer and closer to Castro. I'm sorry, to, to Khrushchev. And here's Fidel. He met in with an elementary school in New York, and this might be the greatest picture ever. <laughs> All the kids dressed. Well, actually, they had to grow beards to meet him. Why is that one still testing his beard? Why wouldn't you? Yeah. That's actually a good question. Why not? He's there. Now, Castro was the real deal. He was the revolutionary. The beard and the uniform was part of his, his look. And they, this pushed them closer to the Soviet Union. Once again, I don't know what Castro would have become, but the U.S. definitely pushed him to this. He might have gone there anyway. So. It was one of those, you can't prove it either way, but Cuba's going to become, we'll get back to Cuba in a way, but I should add, his brother was actually the commander of the army, Raul. And Raul's now the leader of Cuba. There he is meeting with President Obama. Obama opened up relations. With Cuba, the beginning opened up because the United States basically had embargoed Cuba since 1963. But now Trump is he's going to close up that, but Trump is all over the place, so who knows what's going to happen with that. Yeah. Does he age at all? Because he looks the same age in both of those pictures. Raul? Yeah. Yeah, he's getting quite old, but yeah, he's just a little bit grayer hair, yeah. How old is he? Now he's in his mid-70s. He looks like he's in his mid-70s in the third place. <laughs> I know, he does. And let's see. Do we know any other brothers named Raul? Yes, Raul C. Calhoun. 
Now do you see where that came from? All right. Now here's the thing. The CIA, that's what you got to get, the CIA. The CIA now was ordered to take him out just like they had done in Iran, Guatemala, and the time we're trying to do it in Indonesia, Congo, take cash Take cash And they began to train an army of exiles, many of them old Batista thugs. And they trained in, this might shock you, but Guatemala. Hmm, I wonder why Guatemala. That's weird that Guatemala would let them in. And the whole plan was they would invade, they, they invade Cuba, the people of Cuba would rise up and join them. The problem for Eisenhower was this. They were beginning this operation, they all were very confident it would work. But the problem was it wouldn't be ready until 1961. We have an election. So Cuba's going to be a big issue in that election, and now, just like the Democrats were accused of losing China, the Republicans will be blamed for losing Cuba, but now Cuba's only 90 miles away. And then we have the Paris Peace Conference, the U2, which, by the way, here's the amazing thing about the U2. The U2, the United States, did something that was flagrantly illegal, and yet in America it was presented as Soviet tyranny shooting down our illegal spy plane. How dare they shoot down our spy plane? And so, with that, we get to the election of 1960. And the election of 1960, big Cold War election. And this, really, tensions just increased dramatically. And there was a slight recession. So you had a lot of things coming along, and don't forget civil rights. The Democrats nominated John Kennedy. Relatively unknown. But in the new era of television, perfect. He seemed young, he seemed fit, vigorous, he was good looking on the television camera, he was a war hero from World War II. His father, very wealthy in stocks and a little bit of Hollywood and bootlegging. And so he had a lot of money behind him. And here's the thing about John Kennedy he had no record. He was elected to Congress in 48 and then the Senate in 52. And had done nothing. Nothing. He had no record. He was considered a lightweight. And I said, Do you want a lightweight? Now you can create an image for him. Yes. And he was a thoughtful, intelligent man, but he didn't do anything. Hmm? A dark horse. Yeah. In a way, it was like a dark horse. He was a little bit better known than like Hulk or others, but yeah. But you'll see this in the, in the future. <laughs> because candidates who don't have a, a background, well, you can create one. I mean, President Obama in the Senate for two years and had done nothing when he announced his candidacy. I mean, literally done nothing. He gave a couple of speeches, great speeches, but they could invent an image. Donald Trump had no public life. He had done nothing, I mean, privately. He had been in business, done some things, great promoting himself, but he had never governed anything. So they could create an image. And so, from scratch. Now, one thing that's kind of ironic, somebody who had a huge image, the Senate Majority Leader, Lyndon Johnson, who actually wanted to be president, didn't get the nomination, he agreed to be the Vice President. And that actually shocked people that, you know, it's a JFK and LBJ, they're all copying that they are. Lyndon Johnson of Texas left the Senate Majority Leader ship that he had turned into the second most powerful position in Washington, D.C. There had never been anybody in the Senate like Lyndon Johnson. There had never been any president like Lyndon Johnson. There's never been anybody like Lyndon Johnson. And that's, I would argue, a lot of good and a lot of really bad. Lyndon Johnson is unlike anybody else. And he agreed to take this position and hated it, but he'd be vice president. Richard Nixon, Eisenhower's Vice President would run. Now, Nixon had a huge reputation of being smart, competent, cold warrior, experience, but also to see if he had, his nickname was Tricky Dick. He would do anything. In fact, they tried to recreate it. They called it the new Nixon. He is no longer going to be into dirty tricks. <laughs> right. And then in 68, he'd be the new, new Nixon. Then after he resigned from the presidency, he'd be the new, new, new Nixon. <laughs> There's a very good chance there'll be another new Nixon, but then he'll be rising from the grave. <laughs> and you know what? Surprise. Okay, so, <laughs> Richard Nixon, 
and Nixon had all the baggage of being vice president. Now he could be accused of losing Cuba. He could be blamed for the U2. He could be blamed for South Vietnam and Laos. And he could be blamed for Sputnik. The Democrats made it very clear because of Republican intransigence, laziness, ignorance, they have allowed a missile gap. And everybody believed it because of Sputnik. They could see seeds, all seeds of Soviet missiles flying over the Arctic and hitting the United States in just half hour, not enough time to even hide. We're all going to die because of the Republicans. Just like the Democrat or the Republicans used against the Democrats for the bomber gap. This missile gap, here's a US Atlas missile, very dangerous liquid fuel thing. And yes, you could buy a model kit by 1970 of all the Soviet and American missiles. A little extra, real warheads. Okay, so, actually I thought that was really funny. I kind of want it. <laughs> I, it would, I would break it. I use all this. All right, so, so, what's your missile about? Oh, it's huge. The United States had almost 600 medium range missiles in Turkey and Italy that could reach most parts of the Soviet Union. The U.S. also had over 150 ICBMs. You need to know numbers. The U.S. had a lot of missiles. The U.S. had over a thousand bombers, too. Guess how many missiles the Soviets had that could reach the United States on election day? Two. No? One. But the difference? One. One. They had one missile that had to be fueled up in advance of it, two days to fuel because the fuel was so there was a huge missile gap. It just went the other way. The Soviets feel very insecure, especially this kind of campaign rhetoric. Eisenhower knew it wasn't true, but could say nothing. Nixon knew it wasn't true because it was vice president. He had a lot of the CIA information, couldn't say anything because of national security. And now the Democrats could push it, and Kennedy vowed to increase defense spending dramatically. Which you will. And this is the problem with this Cold War rhetoric. In the short run, it helped the Democrats. But then once they're elected, now they got a bill. And you'll see it again in 1980 when President Reagan will do it. And so on. We get people so worked up and you say, oh, we got to defend ourselves. Our, de our military is in shambles. Well, then you got to do something, even if the military is not in shambles, which it was not in 1960, or for that matter, 1980 or for that matter, 2017. But once you build up the rhetoric, you're kind of stuck, and then people have to sneeze, and that's tough. It's also the very first ever presidential debate. Uh, previous. What is, are they just jumping up and down up there? Why does this one shake more? I think that, that tiger's not doing its job. <laughs> All right, let's watch this. Richard Nixon bit. stood at the top of his party. As he mapped out an ambitious 50-state campaign, he was challenged by his opponent, John F. Kennedy, to a series of televised debates, the first in American history. Even when hospitalized for two weeks with a knee injury, Nixon remained confident, anxious for the debates to begin, eager once again to use television to talk directly to the voters. At the he had a staph infection in his knee, a really bad one. His knee swelled up and he thought he might die. He lost 20 pounds. He was pale and weak, but he was overconfident. I mean, Nixon was very intelligent, a debater. He, he knew John Kennedy, liked him personally, but thought Kennedy, no way, he's a lightweight. Oops. Rick talked directly to the voters. At the time, there was a feeling that this overall might be a mismatch. Nixon was the candidate who had more prominence, who had been a member of the House, a member of the Senate, and the Vice President of the United States. Kennedy, he didn't have a particularly do this. strong reputation in right. Congress. He, there was some feeling that he was a right, kind of playboy, that he wasn't too serious a senator. So I think people felt that Nixon had the edge. And I think Nixon felt that he had oh, the edge. Nixon thought it was the candidates himself. need no introduction. Now, one more thing, too. Well, I was a few things. Look at the suits. Gray suits were the style for men. 
But look how Grace Hugh looks in black and white television, especially with that kind of doll background. He kind of blends in, so he becomes this floating white, pale head. Kennedy wore a dark suit, dark tie. And that would set the stage. Now you know as politicians always wear dark suits. Male or female, it's always a dark suit. That's where it starts. That is like a color of, of a leadership. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. Too, uh, According to rules set by the candidates themselves, each man The Nixon-Kennedy debates would forever change the way Americans chose their presidents. Political rallies and old-fashioned handshaking became much less important than the image on the television it's screen. Already happened. You must understand that Nixon himself had said, I don't want any makeup on for this, these particular debates. What I tried to explain to Dick was he has a certain characteristics of his skin where it's almost transparent. Yeah, the thing about Nixon was, he's already pale, and part of when they made it transparent, he was very kind of light skin, and he grew a very heavy beard. In fact, he had a five o'clock shadow, like immediately after he shaved. He's, he's one of those males that can literally cough, like, oh, <laughs> And so, with that, and so, it is a real problem. And neither man said they want makeup. Why? Because men don't wear makeup, right? Real men. So television cameras capture everything. And so Kennedy, they snuck into the bathroom and they applied makeup. And so he kind of could cover up a little bit. Well, Nixon, now that he didn't have makeup and already pale skin, they put something called shave stick on. Have you ever heard of Nair? Which is this chemical that gets rid of air, this pretty nasty chemical. That's what it was. And you stuck a stick deal and you put that on. And the idea was, and I guess it stuck. But it would like eat away the hair so you wouldn't get that hot clock shadow. And so he put this on like this big stick. Nixon had another problem. He really sweated a lot. Maybe, maybe not abnormal. Oh, the bell rang. Oh, well. You want me to remember? Remind me where I was at. I'll finish the story. Huh? And don't forget, I'll tell you, I'll tell you some Castro stories. Nixon, what? So I will tell you the chili story. No, I'll tell you the chili story on the story day after the exam. Okay? Is everyone happy with that except for Joe? Instant O. Joe?